It is time now for Mark Meets, in which I speak to the biggest names in the world of politics, sport, showbiz and beyond. Tonight, Greg Swenson, founding partner of the merchant banking firm Brig McAdam. This guy is a player in the world of global banking. Greg spent his first 11 years in the industry at Lehman Brothers, holding several positions in the fixed income area from 1992 to 2003. Did he see the credit crunch coming and the ultimate collapse of Lehman Brothers? Greg also survived the Twin Towers attacks of 9-11 and is a lifelong conservative and the chair of Republicans Overseas UK. And I'm delighted to say that Greg Swenson joins me now. Hi, Greg. Great to be here, Mark. I guess you're an expat American. How long have you lived in the UK? Almost seven years. Okay. Yeah. And have you settled in? Oh, yeah, completely. It's great. It, how, indefinite now. How has America changed since you left, if at all? Well, there's been some volatility, to say the least. Um, when I left, Barack Obama was president. And I, like everyone else, I was surprised with the 2016 election. You know, coming on the heels of Brexit, I didn't think Trump could win until the morning after Brexit when we realized, wow, this is a movement, you know, this sort of rebellion against the elite sort of traditional politics. So so um, it was only after Brexit that I thought Trump had a chance. And, you know, so it's been there's been some volatility. It's it's been a disappointment in the last year, needless to say. Uh, I don't take any pleasure in saying that. And I think the last week and the last few months have been, you know, just another indicator that that uh but Biden is, is not up to the task. So it's been a, been a lot of volatility. I can't wait till it's over. Would the botched exit from Afghanistan yeah. have happened on Donald Trump's watch? No, not at all. Um, you know, look, there's no doubt that, that President Trump wanted to get out of Afghanistan. He was very clear about that from the beginning. And he was the first, you know, mainstream, I wouldn't call him mainstream, but the first notable Republican to, to criticize the war in general or both wars. And, and the duration of those wars. But he was very deliberate and very clear in his comments to his people, you know, a year and a half, two years ago, that there will be no, you know, there will be no um, equipment left in Afghanistan. We are not leaving until everything is, you know, tidied up. So, look, there, there, were, there were milestones that had to be met with the Taliban in order to complete the exit. He never would have given up um, Bagram Air Base, he would never have left that equipment there. So, and, and these, this isn't just speculation on my part. I mean, these, these are from meetings early on in the process. So, you know, it's a shame what happened, but I can, I think the American public agrees with me that it would not have happened if Trump was still president, nor would this debacle in Ukraine with Russian, you know, the Russian vision. What, that, that is much less likely to have happened. Well, to what extent is that invasion by Putin of Ukraine an example or proof of Biden's weakness? Well, I mean, the list is long. I mean, you start with the, the debacle in Afghanistan. I mean, and that, that's the most obvious. Which set the tone, the, it, the, the, the theme did. of surrender and, and, and withdrawal. It's so un-American. Mm. And, and so that, that's what it made it to the front page. But I think the weakness that Biden demonstrated started much earlier than that. It, it wasn't until Afghanistan where his poll numbers started to crater. But on the first day in office, he basically put his foot on the neck of the American energy business, mm -hmm. basically saying energy leadership, energy independence is not what we're about. And so he actually set up Putin quite nicely um, and and. and you know, again, put his foot on the neck of the energy industry. That's what caused prices to spike, not only in the U.S., but in Europe. So, you know, that, that was long before Putin's invasion of Ukraine. So when you cut, you know, when you, you know, energy policy is security. It's not just about oil and gas prices. It's national security. And then you have the defense spending cuts that he proposed from the get go. So, you know, th those two things, you know, to, to, signal to the world that you don't want to produce oil and gas and that way you're going to benefit the rogues of the world starting with putin but also venezuela and iran and then you also cut spending on defense which you know that's not i don't think that gives a great comfort or a great feeling to our allies especially in the uk but but even nato partners and and european allies you know that that didn't send a great signal when when Biden 
came in and decided that peace through strength was no longer a valid American policy. And that's a shame. What's your reaction to the latest news in a press conference in the last 24 hours from Joe Biden, in which he said that Putin cannot stay in power yeah. and effectively intimated that the White House wanted regime change, a comment then swiftly denied by the White House right. themselves? I mean, they had no choice but to deny it. I mean, that was... I, I think... can't decide what's worse, scripted Biden or unscripted. Oh, no. <laughs> unscripted Biden is much worse, Mark. I mean, look, it's clear that he should not be speaking anymore. Now, there was some criticism about him in the first six or, or 10 months of his term that he was not doing press conferences. He was not speaking to the press. And I understand that. It's a valid criticism. But after a few months of trying, I think after um, Jan 1, he decided, I'm going to you know, talk more. It's a disaster. And so it would serve the administration better. It would serve America better and the world if he did not do press conferences, if he did not go off script. Every time he's done it, it's been a disaster. It wasn't just the gaffe yesterday, which was a real, you know, missed opportunity, unforced error, own goal, whatever you want to call it. You know, that was a great moment for an American president to be in Warsaw, who's, who's you know, and the story in, war, in, in Poland is such a great one. And, and it's so great that an American president went. And I appreciate that he did that. And, mm. and uh, um, you know, I, 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 I was happy about that. So all good. But, you know, the administration had to dial back on that. And it was a gaffe, but not just a, a usual gaffe where you... It, it wasn't just one of those sort of stumbling comedy videos. No. What he said it, it, was, was diplomatically disastrous, disastrous. wasn't it? But we, we've it's got Putin. Putin's on the ropes, isn't he? He's having a nightmare in Ukraine. He's yeah. lost, I think, 16,000 troops yes. so far. Uh, you, you've seen armies mutinying. Yep. And, and therefore, now's the opportunity to hand him, as I've said in my big opinion I, monologue earlier, hand this guy, Putin, who I right. loathe, but a gold-plated, diamond-encrusted ladder to climb down. So, yeah, it was, it was really horrible. I, I, I watched your monologue. I think you hit all the, all the great points. And this, just, this wasn't just one gaffe. Granted, it was a terrible gaffe. And, and it wasn't just Biden tripping on the stairs of Air Force One. I mean, those are funny, but... Sure. Um, Sad, but funny. And I take the point of one of my lovely viewers who said that we shouldn't be mocking him for, no, his, and for, for any cognitive issues he may have, not the which point. is clearly not his fault. I take no pleasure in that. But, yeah. but look, that was a disaster yesterday. It was, it was smart that the administration and, and Blinken, the secretary of state, dialed back on that. They had no choice. But think about it. Thursday, he said about chemical weapons, we will respond in kind. Yeah. So they had to dial that one back. Friday... He was addressing troops. Great. Uh, I, I'm thrilled that Biden was doing that. I, I think he was I think he was um, energized by it. It's great to see it. every time a president goes to see the troops. It's a great moment for the troops, but it's a great moment for the president. But he blew it. And, and when he said regarding Ukraine, when you're there, you know, and that's that was a massive mistake. They had to dial back on that one and, and remind you know, everybody or the press that, no, 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 we're not going into Ukraine. But that's that's just an oddball signal for for a guy who has spent the last month telling Putin what the U.S. will not do, which is really bad tactically. Um, now he says or implies that our troops will be in Ukraine in the near future. I mean, it, was, it was a mistake, obviously. They dialed it back. The press conference at the beginning of the trip, he said, you know, sanctions are not a deterrent when asked by CBS, by the way, CBS, very friendly to, to Biden and, and, and the Democrats. Mouthpiece he, of the White said, House. Oh, no, no, I didn't mean that. And then play the tape from a month ago where he and his entire administration are saying sanctions are a deterrent. They will work. And then and then you go back to January 15th, where he made the gaffe about the minor incursion. I mean, look, it's just been one disaster after another. Yeah, talk about showing Putin a bit of leg. It's like, we, yeah. don't mind, we don't mind a, a small attack. That's right. Just wave it in. Right. Yeah, it is, it is astonishing. It's deeply concerning. Now, in the it's UK, any, any, any uh, political party here in the UK worth its, worth its weight would have a vote of no confidence and replace the leader. Yeah. Not necessarily a snap election, but if this was happening to Boris, the Tories, I believe, would act. Sure. In, in good conscience yeah. and in the national interest. That can't happen in America. No. He hasn't necessarily broken the law and therefore can't be impeached. So does this guy limp on until 2024? And can the world afford that? Well, two, two part answer. One is he can. Mm. He might. Um, he might be impeached after the midterms. 
um, for a number of reasons, probably less to do with Ukraine, but more about the scandals when he was vice president. Uh, but, but also, you know, we are praying that he stays alive because the alternative, as, as you talked early in your show, is Kamala Harris. So I don't think the Democrats want that. Surely the Republicans don't want that. The country doesn't want that. I mean, the only one, po the only one polling lower than Biden is Vice President Harris. And what's the problem with Harris? Because at least she's got her marbles. So why, can't, why shouldn't she become president? The, the problem is, I mean, she was selected strictly because she fit the identity politics profile that, that Biden wished. Because she was eviscerated in the primaries to run she, for president, she was wasn't she? a horrible candidate. I mean, so that the actual she didn't party, even make it to Iowa. the party can't stand her? No, she's unelectable outside of California because California is California. So, um, you know, it, it, she, she did win statewide election there, but only because she was sort of gifted a couple of offices there. That's a different topic for a different day. But outside of California, she polled horribly. She actually um, left the campaign or withdrew from the, the race before Iowa. Mm -hmm. And not only was she polling, you know, in the low single digits, but she was polling number eight in South Carolina, which is essentially it, it, the Democratic primary in South Carolina is predominantly African-American. That's why Joe Biden won the, um, you know, the, the, the nomination. But in South Carolina, she was polling at number eight of the Democrats. And she was claiming to be this African-American candidate and you know, a woman of color. That's the only reason Biden picked her. It was a massive mistake. And I think the country is going to pay for it because there's very little confidence in Biden. Um, I'm worried he can't make it through the next three years. But the alternative is is pretty. And pretty whatever good. happens, the Republicans walk the next it, election, it, don't they? I mean, they could put Mickey Mark, Mouse up for I election. Could win the next election. <laughs> you? <laughs> wants that? But, You'd be brilliant. You know, Listen, uh, after it, the sense, after the sense, you, you you've spoken. Uh, of course, you are a politics man. You're a a banking man as well, and yeah. you've co-founded this uh, major banking organization. You were at ne Lehman Brothers in the late 90s. That's right. This is, of course, this was a tipping point uh, before the credit crunch and the global financial crash when Lehman Brothers was allowed to fall. Mm -hmm. And that sort of created this uh, domino effect of banks around the world collapsing, sovereign debt crises. And uh, I mean, compared to the pandemic, it looks like the good old days. But yeah, at the true. time, it was it was terrible, wasn't it? Because banks were undercapitalized. Mm -hmm. You had governments bailing out uh, here, for example, in the UK, RBS. Sure. So uh, did you see it coming when you were at Lehman Brothers? Yeah, Just that culture of banking? We, uh, you, I saw it coming in the sense that I didn't think anyone was paying attention to credit worthiness of borrowers. And I'm talking about home, home borrowers, right? Some, Not, some people that were unemployed were getting mortgages, weren't yes. they? Yes. And, you know, if you saw the movie The Big Short, I mean, I yeah. think they captured it well. And, yeah. and it's, it's better the second time and the third time. But, <laughs> um, but I thought they did a great job. And, 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 you know, we used to think about prepayment rates and, and all these different derivatives of slight movements in interest rates that would cause prepayments. We thought the worst thing that could happen to a mortgage portfolio was getting paid early. You didn't want your money back. You wanted to keep getting the yield. And no one is really paying attention to the credit risk of the borrowers. Things are different now. The actual consumer has been cleaned up. Consumer balance sheets are much better than they were, obviously, 15 years ago. Uh, the banks are in much better shape. They've been they, recapitalized. They, uh, to the credit of the Bank of England, that was ordered sure. by the governor, wasn't it, to yeah. recapitalize, which was bloody good news two years ago when we went into lockdown. Right. And, and so the banks were in great shape. I'm not sure that having more assets at only four or five banks in the U.S. is a good idea. The big have gotten bigger. I'm not sure that's good, but that's because of overregulation. But what's happened is the, the balance sheets have shifted from the consumer and the banks to governments, to sovereigns. And that's what people should worry about. Sovereign debts. It, it's, it's insane. There are 40% more dollars in circulation than there were two years ago. The, the um, balance sheets of the central banks, the Fed, the BOE, the ECB have swelled, you know, to the, to the point where it's 40% of GDP. That's unprecedented. And, and the actual fiscal deficits in the United States, as well as other countries around the world, are, are way over levered. So, you know, that's what I worry about is 
the, the, the fact that, and no wonder we have inflation, right? You know, surprise, surprise, you know, 7.9% in the U.S., 62 in the U.K. It's going to get worse before it gets better. That's a, a symptom of over, overspending too much stimulus, but also monetary stimulus. So all they've done is really shifted the risk from consumers and corporates and banks to sovereigns. Which is scarier. It's unsettling. Yeah. It's really unsettled. For sure. And we know that the EU, for example, bailed out Greece. Of course. But Italy, France, Spain, they're too big to save. They can't be bailed out, yeah. can they? Yeah. No, it's a good point. It's a really good point because I, I advocated when Greece was in trouble that just Goldman Sachs could have come in and bought Greece. Right. You know, so, you know, that, I know that's kind of not funny, but th there is some tail risk that, you know, some bigger economies can get into trouble. Um, I mean, Italy, Italy were in trouble before the pandemic. Right. I mean, they've they've always had 100 percent debt to GDP. Yeah. I mean, what that, is it now? 160 yeah, percent? It's crazy. 170? They just print more. You know, they, they, they used to print more liras. Now they print more euros. That's that's a, an, a sick economy. It's and we saw that, you know, in the in the crisis, in the, the sovereign crisis in, the, in, you know, 10 years ago when the, the so-called pigs were in trouble. But, you know, that's probably manageable. It's the bigger economies I worry about. And it's the United States that, you know, when, when you have when you have that kind of borrowing without any ability to to, to pay back. I mean, that, that's it's really unsettling. And with the now Chinese rates going, China up. owning billions of those borrowed dollars, sure. of course, which you know, began, I think, under Clinton. You know, it really has. And and that's a way for China to exert some control, although it doesn't matter who owns it. Mm. The, the fact is you owe someone, you know, the public will call it. And so, you know, th this is a very difficult time. As rates are going up, it's going to be hard for governments like the U.S. to service that. So as they were borrowing money during the Obama years, you know, where it was just borrow and and keep interest rates low, which enabled the governments to borrow and at the same time enabled wealthy people to borrow. And so surprise, surprise, financial assets, stocks, bonds and real estate went up. The real economy suffered. We had a little break from that with Trump. Now we have the same thing, but on steroids, especially during the lockdowns. So you've had massive, massive asset inflation, yeah. but you're having a, a, a bit of a struggle in the real economy, you know, so-called Main Street, yeah. where real wages are down in the last year. You know, since Biden took office, they're down 2.2 percent in terms of real terms. So, you know, th this is a troubling moment. And as rates go up, yes, that's going to be a, a difficult for middle income people. It's not going to be difficult for wealthy people. But for middle income people, rates are going up. It's going to be harder to service the mortgages, harder to for a young family to buy a new home, but also consider that it's going to be more difficult for the government to service the debt. And 75% of the debt issued by the US government and the, and the UK as well was bought by the Bank of England or in Europe, the ECB in the US, the Fed. They were buying 75% of the bonds. And so that wasn't really a market that was functioning. And would you therefore not say, and, and very briefly, unfortunately, because the yeah. clock's against us, we could talk to you for hours, you must come back. But uh, when you read in the paper today, in the mail on Sunday, uh, medical chiefs saying that we're going to have to consider more coronavirus measures as cases rise, possible lockdowns yeah. in the winter. I mean, surely that's a sick joke now, given the state of the economy. It has to be a sick joke, Mark, because that will be... I mean, how I much more of a battering can the economy take? It's intolerable. And Americans, and, and I, I, I feel like there's such a great similarity between the two countries. The one criticism I had about the UK, the people during that first lockdown especially, is that they tolerated it. And in the U.S., it, many of the states just wouldn't tolerate it. It, it cannot happen again because it, it's been proven ineffective, first of all. So forget, you know, forget about the cultural challenges, the constitutional issues. Let's just talk about the science. It didn't work. So there's no reason to do it again from a scientific perspective. But, but also it's economically destructive and it's immoral and against the constitutional rights of the people. So at least in the U.S., you had 50 incubators. Yeah. And in, in the 25 to 30 red states, Republican controlled states, the people said no. 
and look at what happened. The well, the, the, outcomes per, were the, better. the age adjusted yep. per capita death rate from Florida is lower than that That's of right. California. And Same Florida country. lifted all restrictions months before but California they had did. Two, two or three weeks of, you know, stop the stop the, um, you know, flatten the curve. Oh, yeah. Stop the spread. And, and that worked. So we we've seen what worked, what didn't work. And even in some of the purple states, you saw marches on the Capitol in Michigan. Mm. You saw lawsuits in Wisconsin that went up to the Supreme Court in Wisconsin, and the judges said, no, illegal, can't do it. So, no, granted, New York, Illinois, California, they all locked down. They're still locked down. Kids are wearing masks now in Illinois. Ron DeSantis, uh, briefly, I mean, he'd make a great president, Absolutely. wouldn't he? he he's, yeah. he's looking better and better. I just wonder whether, it, for, for those that are supportive of the Republican cause, perhaps yeah. he'd be a preferred option to Trump. It, to many, he, he is, and including me. And, and I Just think his age it's and his vigor, age, vigor could serve two terms. Yeah. And he's Trump policies without the baggage, mm. without but the will, will Trump. Trump is uh, Trump will decide, won't he? Of course, because if, would win. If, if the Donald decides to run, yes. the Santis can only hope to be his running mate. It, if if the election were tomorrow, Trump would win the primaries. Mm. He'd easily win the, the general election. But my concern is, you know, Back to the point, two terms versus one, a lot of baggage with Trump. And, you know, this unfiltered, I can say anything I want at any time and offend anybody. We've had two terms of that, one with Trump and now one with Biden. Well, only one year with Biden. But Biden's really not that much difference. different. He's, he's defensive. He's unfiltered. He's clearly undisciplined. And so if you could have a DeSantis who's or Tom Cotton or Mike Pompeo, you know, a Trump policy person. But a disciplined politician. But with discipline. Yeah. And without, yeah. you know, some of the drama. Uh, you, very briefly, um, do, you right. think, do you think Donald might act in a national interest and say, go on, Ron, it's yours? I hope so. I yeah. hope so. But, you it, know, he's, it, it, it he's all depends. Trump. He, he, um, you know, he's got an ego. We're, we're out of time. I, I do want just some sentiment from you about the horror of 9-11. Yeah. You were in New York City sure. on that horrific day. Yeah. Uh, where were you? I was at One World Financial. I, as we yeah. discussed, I worked at Lehman Brothers, which is connected by the Pedway to the North Tower. So, yeah. you know, about as close as you could be without being in the North Tower. Yeah. And um, I, at the time, I lived in Chicago, and I was also there in the 1993 bombing, coincidentally. So the, the point was no one wanted to travel with me anymore because every time I went to New York, something bad happened. But um, no, look, it, it was, it was uh, a, a difficult moment for New York, a difficult mo moment for my, my friends at Lehman Brothers. But I wasn't running up, you know, 10 floors and saving a dozen people. I mean, it, it, there was some- You were in New York City that day. Yeah. And you went into work, uh, and I, as I remember it, watching the video footage, sure. a beautiful sunny day. Oh yeah, it was, it was perfect. It was a tu you know, Tuesday, perfect weather. You know, nobody had coats on, obviously. You know, it, it, it was, it was a, a quite obviously quite memorable. But, you know, we, again, I lived in Chicago, so I was just there visiting and just bad luck, bad timing. But it, it was also a day where so many stories and so many heroes emerged from this thing. Not, of course, the police and the firemen, but, you know, Wells Crowther, who, who went to my university, Boston College, and, you know, ran up and down the stairs, saved a dozen people before he died, you know, because he didn't want to leave the building, not, not when there were people still upstairs. So, you know, terrible day, in history, but also some some. And you, you obviously you you heard the, this awful explosion. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, and the, the air. I mean, could you breathe? It was um the, the first one you could breathe because I was inside, and the the mm. tower. You know, the plane hit you know way up on the yeah. whatever seventy fifth floor. So a um, lot of noise. You know, shook shook our building. Everybody had to leave immediately. It was when the second one hit because I was outside for that one, watching the North Tower burn. I thought I was just going to go back into the office, which is crazy in, in retrospect. But um, when the second plane hit, that's when you really felt the, the air, the oxygen kind of sucked out of the, the region. And, yeah. and that's when you knew things were really bad. Now, I, know you, I, I know you bless God that you're, you're here, and we all do. Of course. But um, will you ever get over it? Has it stayed with you? you, you know, I, I think about it 
all the time. You know, I mean, yeah. I, especially back then. I mean, every day. I it, look there. There it was. A, it was a terrible moment. I I feel so lucky that I was there. There was a moment where I didn't think I'd see my wife and my kids briefly, but no. There are so many people who had so much more suffering than I did. I, no, I don't even think that way. I just I'm too much of an optimist. Well, look, thank God Good you were, Thank God you did. Uh, you did get get through that horrific day. Um, some did and some didn't, and it's uh, a stain on human history, but uh, it's important that you're able to tell that story. And Absolutely. That we, we cannot yeah. forget the, the true horror of which human beings are capable and the hateful we're ideology. We're seeing it right now. Yeah. That, we're seeing it again, the hateful ideology yeah. that, that fuels uh, that evil. Uh, well, look, what a privilege to have you on the show. Great Happy Mother's Day. <laughs> was your mum good? Was she nice? Uh, well, she was great. She'd be about 101 or something. What was her name? Uh, so Leona. Leona. Irish Lovely Leona. She did a good job. Is that right? Okay. The Irish Americans. There you go. Uh, Greg Swenson, what a privilege to have you on the show. Great Thank you here. so much Thanks. for joining us. A fascinating conversation. Greg is the chairman of Republicans Overseas. He's a political commentator. He's in banking. He's a man of many talents.